Hello there, my fellow Warhammer Fantasy aficionados, and welcome to the start of yet another branch of lore from this expansive universe. At the suggestion of a couple of my subscribers, who are clearly very big fans of this faction, I have decided to finally start covering the so-called Dark Elves of Warhammer Fantasy. This is not exactly a brand new lore series, since I have talked about the Elves before. Maybe more importantly, I have talked about how the Dark Elves came into existence, so to speak, via the horrible civil war on Ulfuan known as the Sundering. I have not, however, expanded on the Dark Elves since. So for today, I wanted to talk about some of their history after their arrival in Nagaroth and their conflict with the High Elves from their perspective. Fun fact, before I begin, since the map of the world in Warhammer Fantasy is very similar to our own map of the Earth, you might notice that the Dark Elves settled in what we know as Canada. Hashtag Canadian Elves I am your host, the Druki narrator for today, and without further ado, let us learn more about Dark Elf history, shall we? The fleet of Malekith sailed westwards for many weeks, through rain, howling wind, and waves like mountains that had been unleashed by Nagarif and Tyrannoch plunging into the ocean. Ever towards the sunset, Malekith led his people, towards the dark and welcoming night. Across the Sea of Chill and the Sea of Malice, the fleet traveled. Two storm-wracked bodies of water, which had claimed many elven ships and their brave crews, as they had attempted to explore the rugged coastlines of the Western Seas. In the uttermost westward reaches of the Sea of Malice, in the freezing shadows of the jagged Iron Mountains, the Black Arcs of Nagarif finally halted. It was here, in this desolate land, that Malekith declared he would recreate the glories of Anarion's reign, and build a capital to put the greatest cities of Ulfuan to shame. The Black Ark that had once been part of Malekith's castle beached itself upon a stony shore, fusing with the slate and iron-rich rocks of the foothills bordering the water. Food was scarce, though Malekith and his nobles did lead hunts across the foothills and brought back deer, boar, and great shaggy mammoths to feed upon. Freezing winds howled down from the north, bringing snowstorms and chilling ice. More dangerous than the perils of frostbite and starvation were the many vicious predators stalking these strange lands. The dark forests to the south and east, and the forbidding mountains to the west, held many fell creatures and hundreds of the Nagarofi were devoured in the night, as they made camp in the wilderness. Scouts quickly found rich loads of minerals in the mountains, but Malekith's people had no aptitude for mining or smelting, nor for building the walls which would be needed to keep away the mutant creatures, nor for farming or animal husbandry. You might ask yourselves at this point, what were they good at? They were warriors, and most had known nothing but war. Against demons, against orcs, against beastmen, and lastly, against their fellow elves. Malekith soon realized that although he still had a formidable fighting army, his people cared nothing for the actual building of a new civilization. If the Druki, the Dark Elves as their enemies had called them during the Civil War, were to build an actual kingdom in the West, they would need a labor force to build it for them. Because actual hard work is not how the Dark Elves roll. And so began the bloodthirsty raids of the Dark Elves. In the beginning, their attacks were directed solely against their kin in Ulfuan, to take food and other supplies. The High Elves, for the most part, would fight to the death rather than be taken in battle, and so Malekith's labor force didn't grow as fast as he would have wanted. The word then arrived from ships that had traveled further east, to the forests and mountains of the colonies where Malekith had once fought alongside the dwarves. Primitive humans lived there, in their caves and mud huts. 
They were brutal and stupid, but the Dark Elves didn't care for that, for humans had the great quality of breeding very fast when compared to the Elves, and were physically strong workers. Knowing that these short-lived savages could be easily controlled and swiftly grown in numbers, Malekith dispatched many fleets over the coming decades, to steal away whole villages of humans and bring them back to Nagaroth. Though they understood very little of what their lords were asking of them, the humans learned well enough from the whip of their masters how to dig ore from rock, herd cattle and forage in the woods. Guided by some captured elven masons and carpenters, the slaves began to build a city around Malekith Citadel. He would name this place Nagarond, the city of winter, and its dark spires started to grow higher and higher over the growing pirate port which nestled in its black shadow. With his capital established, Malekith turned his attention back to Ulfuan, some of his people still clung to a pitiful existence in the ruins of Nagarif, while the Blighted Isle, and upon it the Shrine of Cain, was held by neither side. Though he feared to wield the Sword of Cain himself, Malekith was well aware of its power, and the vengeance Kalador would wreak upon the Nagarothi should he claim it. To ensure that the Phoenix King did not claim the God Slayer, Malekith led an attack that swept across the northern isles of Ulfuan. The elves of Ulfuan remembered the lessons of the civil war, and Malekith was unable to forge across the mountains to attack the inner kingdoms. At sea, the burgeoning High Elf fleet grew bolder and bolder, and reinforcements and supplies from Nagarond were often intercepted, further weakening the grip of Malekith. Kalador responded to Malekith's invasion with typical determination, ordering the construction of immense fortifications at each of the main passes through the Anuli Mountains. Never again would Malekith be allowed free passage to ransack and pillage the shrines and cities around the Inner Sea. For three decades, the armies of Malekith probed and assaulted the outposts of the mountains, but Kalador's armies were well organized and disciplined, and every attack was beaten back. While their armies held back the sporadic raids and attacks of the Nagarofi, the High Elves completed the first of their citadels, also known as the Griffin Gate, which historians would later call the Unconquered Fortress. The other great gates of the Anuli followed in the coming years, and soon the passes between the Sundered Lands and the Inner Kingdoms were separated by mighty walls, held by stalwart defenders, ingenious war machines, and powerful spells of protection. While Malekith was fighting upon Ulfuan, control of Nagaroth rested with his mother, Morafi. Now steeped in the blackest of magic, Morafi sought further means to increase her mystical power. She sent expeditions into the realm of chaos to the north, tasking them to seek out artifacts of the dark gods and to observe the ever-changing miasma of chaos energy. Very few of these expeditions actually returned, and none of them came back to Nagaroth unscathed. Too great were the perils for Morafi to venture there herself, and so she commanded a great tower to be built in the north of Nagaroth, from which she could personally look upon the energy of the gods. The North Tower, or Grand, this citadel was called, and here Morafi founded the so-called Convent of Sorceresses. She set hideous tests of magical and mental power to find the most promising young seers and witches from among the Dark Elves. Many of them did not survive, but those that did were hardened by their trials, as bitter and devoted to the pursuit of black magic as their mistress. Morafi guided this coven of sorceresses to studying the realm of chaos, gazing into its mesmerizing, mind-shredding depths to discern its secrets, learn what had passed and what would come to pass. With her dark oracles to aid her, the paths of the future were laid out before Morafi like an insane map, and with this knowledge she charted the course of destiny for her own son. 
Yet for all her foresight and cunning, Morafi could not locate all the strands of fate that would actually lead to the ultimate victory over Ulfuan. The war at sea swung back and forth as much as the war on land, but after two centuries of naval warfare, the High Elves were slowly gaining the upper hand. Their ships and crews were more disciplined than the bloodthirsty corsairs of Nagarov, who were used to raiding human or orc settlements and fighting against unwitting and unsubtle opponents. The High Elves hit the Dark Elf convoys hard and fast, sapping the strength of the Nagaron fleets. Even the mighty Black Arcs, once invincible, had met their match. The Palace of Joyous Oblivion, commanded by Lutheran Felharth, was sunk by the enchanted Starblade Ram of the dragon ship Indraugnir in a sea battle not far from the Blighted Isle. Their confidence was shattered by this blow, and the raiders of Nagaroth were more reluctant than ever to dare the High Elven patrols over the coming years. Though Malekith could make no inroads towards the Inner Kingdoms, his armies remained poised on the far side of the Anuli Mountains, ever ready for a moment of weakness. The huge drain on the fleets and armies required to watch for Dark Elven attacks seriously undermined the economy of Ulfuan, which in turn weakened all her colonies. With the Inner Kingdoms secure against attack by the mountain fortresses, Kalador finally decided the time was nigh to drive Malekith and the Dark Elves from Ulfuan once and for all. For nearly the following decade, the High Elf fleets sunk any Nagarofi ships which approached the northern coast. Their naval dominance was supreme, and the Dark Elves isolated on Ulfuan grew weary of their master's constant attacks against the impregnable fortress gates. It was perhaps untimely then that Kalador chose to heap pressure upon Malekith by launching an offensive against the Shadowlands in a bid to claim the Blighted Isle. Faced with this sudden aggression by their kin, the Dark Elves quickly set aside their seditious plotting and scheming and stopped their desertions, instead rallying to the banner of the Witch King. Fighting for their ancestral lands now, the Nagarofi were hate-filled and vicious, and Kalador's advance was swiftly stopped. Knowing that the retreat would be to give the Dark Elves an opportunity to counterattack, Kalador pushed onward fighting for every hillock, valley, and isle. After another decade, the Dark Elves were finally driven from the Blighted Isle, but only at tremendous cost. Malekith's worst fear seemed at hand, when Kalador traveled to the Shrine of Cain. Yet, for all the Witch King's dread, Kalador resisted the whispers of the God of Murder, and left the Sword of Cain on its black altar. With the Blighted Isle now in High Elven hands, Kalador set sail to return to Lodern. His departure was seen by the scrying spells of Morafi, and she called down a storm to sink the High Elven fleet. Many of the ships survived, however, but the fleet was scattered, and Kalador's vessel was set off far from course. Guided by the magic of Morafi, Malekith's pirates swiftly caught up and boarded the Phoenix King's ship. Knowing that their intent was to capture him and subject him to unspeakable tortures, Kalador jumped into the sea and drowned. However, his death obviously didn't end the war. But what happens next with Malekith and the Dark Elves of Nagarov will be a topic for another time. And this, my friends, has been what I wanted to tell you about the Druki history for today. There is a huge deal of lore concerning their story, up to the very end of Warhammer Fantasy at the end times. I will definitely not be doing another four consecutive videos just with Dark Elf history, but if you guys enjoyed this episode and would like to know more, please let me know in the comments below. Was this video informative or entertaining? In that case, please click the like button and subscribe for more content. Thank you very much for watching, and I wish you all an awesome day. Isha's blessings be upon you.